Hello, and welcome to the Los Pollos Hermanos family. My name is Gustavo, but you can call me Sus. Every hero needs a good villain. In most hero stories, it's pretty much a given that the good guys win and the bad guys lose. Nobody's watching a Spider-Man movie on the edge of their seat thinking how Peter Parker could die at any given moment. That's not where the intrigue comes from. These stories are carried by their characters, especially the primary villain responsible for inciting the conflict that drives the story. A hero is only as strong as his villain, not in the sense of physical strength, but the strength of their character. We've all seen baddies who are evil just for for the sake of being evil, or who have goals like world domination because hey, th that's just what bad guys do. When the villain plays so heavily into cliches, they end up feeling like they exist solely because the heroes need something to defeat, which sometimes is the case, but you only gotta make it so obvious, like li lie to me or something. The greatest villains in fiction are those with believable motivations. Not necessarily ones you agree with, but ideas where you can look at the villain and be like, yeah. Yeah, I can see how you got here. In reality, right and wrong isn't so black and white. A little dash of moral ambiguity goes a long way to humanize an otherwise purely evil character and creates a much more compelling narrative. I want to go through a few of my favorite empathetic villains and make sure they're up, up to Poyo standards. standards. Starting with one that absolutely no one is surprised to see, Thanos. Thanos was right, half of y'all need to go. That's a common sentiment I'm met with every time I open twitter.com. Follow me by the way. And to be honest with you, I can't say that I disagree. What's crazy to me is how Thanos came to such a brilliant conclusion without even having to visit that godforsaken website. Thanos' home planet of Titan was plagued by overpopulation. As the inhabitants increased, resources dwindled, and it ultimately led to the planet's demise. Thanos offered a solution. Genocide. But random, just passion is fair to rich and poor alike. But the people rejected his plan, died anyway, and Thanos said I told you so and hit a Fortnite default dance on their bodies. After seeing what happened to his own home, Thanos made it his goal to gather all six Infinity Zones and use them to enact his plan on a universal scale, so no one would ever have to suffer the same fate as his planet. His cause was noble, but there's just one problem with his plan. It's shit. Even if he managed it on a planetary scale and killed half of everyone on Titan, the population would eventually bounce back. So this plan is something that has to be applied at regular intervals rather than being a one-time fix-all. Also, a lot more than half of all life is going to die, and it's quite possible that several planets will go extinct as a direct result of the snap. On Earth, people were snapped out of things like driving a car or piloting a plane. The snap would also cause millions, billions, or trillions of indirect deaths. Some some people may get off with just an injury, so they can go to the hospital and- Oh, wait, um, half of our doctors are gone. We'd lose essential workers like healthcare providers, truck drivers, farmers, or even Twitch streamers. People are resources too, and if the people managing things like food and water cease to exist, those resources are gone as well. There will be less mouths to feed, yeah, but also less hands to feed those mouths. I know I'm not the first to say it, and I sure as hell won't be the last, but what was so wrong with doubling the universe's resources instead of having the people? Don't get me wrong, that's not a flawless plan either, but it would still prolong the whole everyone wondering where their next meal will come from for several more years at the least. But wondering what your next meal will be doesn't have to be a problem with this video sponsor, HelloFresh. Hey, uh, what do you want to get for dinner? I don't know, I don't, I don't really have a place in mind. I, I already made us dinner with HelloFresh. Are you telling me a shrimp fried this rice? No, it was me. I did it. Now, I may not look like a Michelin star chef, but cooking is actually one of my favorite hobbies. But when you cook for a while, it's easy to fall into a rotation of just two or three meals that you regularly cook and not try new dishes. That's why I was really excited for this opportunity to try out HelloFresh. HelloFresh allows you to choose from a menu of dozens of different meal options every week. They offer vegetarian and pescatarian options too. The food comes fresh and pre-portioned in a box with just the things that you need so nothing is wasted. I went for the spicy chicken bowls, truffle risotto, and mushu beef bowl. I know it says pork, but HelloFresh also allows you to switch the meat on various dishes, so I chose the beef. Alright, we keep it halal on this channel. Each meal comes with a straightforward and easy to follow recipe designed to get you out of the kitchen and enjoying your meal as fast as possible. Making HelloFresh ideal for anyone who wants to try cooking but is put off by the massive time investment that seemingly goes into it. Or honestly just anyone that wants great food delivered to their doorstep. Use my link or go to HelloFresh.com and use code POGNASU NOV70. 
for 70% off plus free shipping on your first box. Something that a lot of MCU viewers don't know is that Thanos' motivation behind the snap was very different in the original comics. It was much, much simpler. Instead of killing half of the universe to prevent overpopulation, he did it to impress a girl. In the Marvel comics, the personification of death is represented by a woman, and Thanos is obsessed with her. She's entirely responsible for the mad titan that everyone knows today. Thanos was originally just some nerdy kid with purple skin. As a teenager, he carried out the first two murders in the history of his planet Titan because death told him to. Two murders turned into 17, and then he killed his own mother and destroyed his home planet. He continues his rampage throughout the cosmos, killing everyone from superheroes to his own children, all while being strung along by a flimsy promise from death to eventually be with her. And honestly, this is a villain motivation I can get behind. Restoring balance to the universe out of some twisted sense of altruism? Who can relate to that? Chasing somebody with no interest in you? Now that's relatable. Not for me though. I'm built different. So how did she react to all the blood he shed for her? Huh? Yeah, that's cool. Or whatever. If you really loved me, you would eradicate half the universe. So, he tracked down all six Infinity Stones, built a shrine for her, moved entire planets to spell his name, and snaps half of all life out of existence. What did she think about this? Uh, yeah, it's, it's okay, I guess. I'm gonna go with Deadpool. Yeah, he did not like that. On the topic of committing genocide for a white woman, we have Vlad Dracula Tepish from Castlevania. Being the vampire of all vampires, Dracula is a natural enemy to humans and lives in isolation from them. That is, until he meets Lisa, who he falls in love with and marries. She urges him to integrate himself into human society to better understand them and he agrees. Until the church arrests Lisa for practicing black magic, also known as science. Ugh, it moves on its own and they burn her at the stake. Half of y'all? Nah. All of y'all gotta go. Dracula releases his horde of demons and begins his purge of the entire human race. He believes that humans are a species whose very nature is to lie, kill, cheat, and steal. And the world would be better off without them. From the perspective of a creature at the top of the food chain, in a world where humans don't occupy that spot, I get it. He perceives them as lesser than. I'm sure there are plenty of people who would nuke spiders off the face of the planet with no regard for the impact that will have on the ecosystem. And I'ma keep it real with you, as a, as a human myself, I'm not a big fan of these human guys either. And these particular humans killed the only human that he ever actually cared about, which he uses as justification to end all human life. Even the innocent, because... There are no innocents! Not anymore! Any one of them could have stood up and said, no, we won't behave like animals anymore. Well, yes, but actually no. Someone could have stepped up to the church and tried to stop it, but they'd swiftly be given a nice warm spot right next to Lisa. The church is corrupt, and the show goes to great lengths to hammer that point home. Whether you're religious or not, I think everybody can acknowledge the importance of the separation of church and state. Absolute power corrupts absolutely, and men of the cloth are no different. When a religious leader is also the head of state, they may start to act as if they themselves are the religion and pervert the message with things that were never there for their own self-benefit. Imagine walking into a Chipotle and being like, God said you should give me an extra scoop of- Get the fuck out. Okay. So yes, Dracula's right that humans lie and cheat, but that doesn't mean that there aren't any innocent. The villain that actually presents the best point is this particular demon who kills the bishop in episode 4. She was a witch! Lies? In your house of God? No wonder he has abandoned you. But we love you. We couldn't be here without you. Let me kiss you. He then, uh, gives him a smooch on the cheek and tucks him in good night. Yeah. Naruto is a series in which there aren't really any evil villains, just a bunch of people with good intentions who are a little misguided. Okay, maybe very misguided. You get the idea. No one is just pure evil. They're all acting out their own brand of justice. That is, of course, until Naruto gives them a stern talking to with the classic talk no jutsu. For example, Pain, one of the show's most notorious villains, seeks to unite the world through, well, Pain. He grew up in a country ravaged by war, and he's seen firsthand the mindless death and destruction it brings. Because of this, he aims to create a weapon of mass destruction that he'll use to effectively nuke the world and unite everyone through shared pain, and deterring all conflict through fear. I think Pain is an amazing villain, 
but I can't say I see the vision. His heart's in the right place though. A villain with a much less painful approach to ending all suffering is the final antagonist, Madara Uchiha, who aims to cast an illusion on the entire world which forces everyone into an eternal dream in which they live out their ideal lives. That doesn't sound all that bad. But unsurprisingly, the heroes all reject this idea. Of course they do. Even though they're offered paradise, they choose not to accept it because it's not real. Or at least not what they know to be real. No one wants to be plugged into the Matrix. This phenomenon is exemplified by philosopher Robert Nozick in his thought experiment the experience machine, which posits that humans don't just chase pleasure. If presented the opportunity to enter a simulated reality far better than the current reality, most people would not enter the simulation. Reality, even with its suffering, still holds an intrinsic value that makes it better than the purely pleasurable simulation. However, I don't think that this proves people don't want to be in the matrix, but rather people just don't want to know they're in the matrix. Even if the solution that Madara offers is a better one, aka perfect world in which Boruto never exists, everyone will reject it simply because they already know it'll be a dream, and no one wants to willingly plug themselves into the Matrix. Another execution of this plan is the final arc in Persona 5 Royal, which I know just released on all platforms, so a lot of people are playing it for the first time. Big spoiler warning ahead for y'all, so this is your chance to skip ahead. Much like Madara, the final villain of the game Dr. Maruki uses his powers to create an ideal world where everyone is living their best life. The only difference being he didn't have to kill anyone to do it and that he didn't put everyone under a dream spell. Maruki quite literally just changed the very fabric of reality. He didn't plug people into the matrix, he took the matrix and made it real. By taking control of the collective unconscious and altering everyone's cognition, Maruki was able to erase everyone's trauma and even bring people back to life. D don't think about the details too much, it's, it's anime magic. But of course, just like in Naruto, our heroes vehemently reject his idea. Why? Even among our group, the Phantom Thieves, everyone but the protagonist was shown a perfect life that they were content to indulge in until they were woken up by the player character. Their experiences in this world are indistinguishable from their real life experience. Besides, Maruki is literally giving the masses what they want. Earlier in the story, when the Phantom Thieves went too hard against the grain, the collective unconscious literally chose to wipe them from existence in order to maintain the status quo. People don't want to wake up. and. Who the hell is this group of teenagers to decide for them? They confront Maruki and drop bars like, But what about the people who want to take on the world themselves? How is it right to rob them of their opportunities? Well, as everyone made very clear earlier, that's just you. What about this guy? Did you ask the guy living with glass bones and paper skin, one kidney, one testicle, no living relatives and 99 cents to his name? How badly do you think he wants to return to reality and take the world head on? What is your power of friendship doing for him? Sure, Maruki is a bit of an egotistical asshole with a god complex, but so what? His own trauma motivated him to free others from theirs. And what exactly is so inherently evil about giving people exactly what they're asking for? The game does give you an optional ending where you can accept Maruki's world, which I think is great, but the story doesn't do much to try and give his stance much validity. Which is unfortunate, because I think it would have really fleshed out the game's themes of individuality and personal autonomy. Next up, we got Black Panther's Eric Killmonger. This movie gotta have the most preventable villain of all time. We're given a look into his origin story in the prologue, where the previous Black Panther is forced to kill his own brother who betrayed him, leaving his son Eric an orphan. Now, after killing his bro, does he A, bury the body and take his nephew back to Wakanda, or B, bury the body and leave his nephew in the US, but take care of him from the shadows? Nah, let's leave the body there for the child to come find, thus traumatizing him and then forcing him to figure out how to support himself into adulthood. What was the reason for this, you may ask? I chose my people. I chose Wakanda. Bro, that is literally your people. Wakanda has this motto of not within our borders, not our problem. Look at these African children seemingly living in poverty just outside the border. Or are they just actors put here by Wakanda to keep up the image that they were developing country? Either way, they're outside the line, so fuck them. Wakanda has had vibranium for millions of years, which means they sat through the slave trade while being the most technologically advanced society and plugged their ears going, None of my business is none of my business. Apparently, their motto also applies to their own flesh and blood. 
Killmonger wants to take Wakanda's resources and help the rest of the world, and can anyone really disagree with him? Now, uh, he wants to do that by starting a race war? You had me in the first half, I'm not gonna lie. The X-Men film series is one of incredibly inconsistent quality, but one constant is Magneto. No matter the movie, I always find him to be an incredibly compelling villain. Another constant with these movies is the perennial struggle between mutants and non-mutants, and usually leading a group of radical mutants is Magneto, and can you really blame the guy? Surviving the worst genocide in history, having his mother killed in front of him by non-mutants trying to exploit his powers, trying to live a quiet life and having it all ripped away from him once again. If there's anyone with a valid reason to start a race war, it's this guy. I'll never get over the irony of telling a holocaust survivor to excuse men just following orders, which gave us one of the coldest lines in the entire franchise. I've been at the mercy of men just following orders. Never again. Attack on Titan? Nah, I'm just kidding. I'm not about to defend mass murder for like the third time in this video. Or am I? Guren Lagann is an anime which epitomizes started from the bottom, now we're here. Actually, the characters literally start from below the bottom, and at every stage of the show, the villains provide much more convincing arguments than the heroes. They live in a world where all the humans live underground in fear of creatures known as beastmen, who roam the surface killing humans indiscriminately. In one of the underground villages, they only have enough resources to support 50 people, so anytime they exceed that population, people are chosen at random to leave to the surface. It's not the most compassionate solution, but hey, it, it gets the job done. The alternative is to let the number continuously grow and eventually suffer food shortages. It sets an upper limit, so it's still a better solution to overpopulation than Thanos had. The main characters don't offer a better solution and just kinda say, hey, this is bad. We later learn that the Beastmen are also performing their own population control. By killing humans who reach the surface, they keep the world's population under 1 million, because reaching 1 million could spell the end of the human race. Again, the heroes just say, this is bad, stop doing this, and kill the leader of the Beastmen. Fast forward a decade and humans have gone from this to this, and the population hits 1 million, triggering the protocol set by an alien race to eradicate humanity. Apparently, the rapid evolution of the human race is due to an energy known as spiral power, and the overuse of this power will eventually lead to the end of the universe, and this is what the aliens are trying to prevent. Once again, the humans offer no alternative solution and just kill the final villain. Village running out of resources? We don't give a damn about that! Humans evolving too quickly? We don't give a damn about that! Causing the death of everything in existence? We don't give a damn about that! The end of the universe? Nah, that sounds like a problem for later. You could show the main cast of this anime this picture, and their answer would unironically be simply handle the situation. Trying to present them with any logical argument is just going to end up with you six feet deep. Next is Silco from Arcane, the best villain in anything I've seen in recent memory. The man isn't afraid to play dirty, he'll lie, kill, and betray to get what he wants. And what he wants is independence from a progressive city built on the suffering and exploitation of his people, a goal more real and understandable than most villains in fiction. He only really sheds blood when he needs to, and ultimately reaches his goal through diplomacy. Some people had complaints about the new Batman movie and all the changes that they made to the villain, but I couldn't disagree more. Batman stays true to the villain that he's always been, and continues his trend of bullying and beating on the mentally ill. While far from a noble cause, I respect the writer sticking to the source material, and at the end of the day, hey, he, he doesn't kill anybody, so it's A-OK. -okay. For a villain with the most tragic origin story, I gotta give it to Dr. Doofenshmirtz. Neither of his parents showed up to his own birth. With a backstory like that, man, you could be up to the most devious, nefarious evil deeds and the world would simply have to understand. Next is Ganondorf from The Legend of Zelda. I mean, I get it. If I was the only triple F doggy doo doo stinky two pack of ass tier character in a Smash Bros game, I might have to start my own villain arc. And last but not least, the one that everyone's been waiting for. We got Arthur the Aardvark. In terms of an empathetic villain, it really doesn't get much better than this. Arthur had a tough childhood and he's had to live with the shame of being related to DW. Maybe there's a contest for lonely children after this. It's only children, DW. A lonely child is what you're gonna be when I sell you. That alone is enough to send most people off the deep end. But to top it all off, he's a knitter.